Gordon didn't mention that uh, I think my favorite juxtaposition of jobs was when I was simultaneously writing a column in the National Post and a column in Adbusters. Uh, <laughs> and those two didn't know about each other. Um, uh, that was good. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here tonight, and a more than usually uh, um, profound honor to be part of this uh, lecture series now in its uh, second iteration to follow my distinguished colleague uh, Vital Drybczynski and to do honor to the memory of Warren Gill. Uh, it's my firm conviction that the only form of immortality that humans enjoy is living on in the memories of people that they leave behind when they pass. And uh, by all accounts, and from Anne's remarks and other things I've heard, Warren is one of the immortals. Uh, and that is uh, an honor and uh, something that I think all of us aspire to. Uh, so it's, it's a great pleasure and um, responsibility to be part of that. I want to acknowledge also the SFU City Program. I was saying this before uh, we came in tonight, that uh, my sister-in-law, Jamie McFedrin, I want that on the record, Jamie, hi, Jamie, uh, got her degree because the City Program was in existence and she was able to take classes after working all day uh, hard at an office job here in downtown Vancouver. Uh, to me, this is the essence of a university's mission to allow education to be accessible to people no matter what their circumstances. And uh, I'm very pleased to be able to acknowledge that uh, connection to SFU and uh, the downtown campus. Uh, my remarks tonight are uh, in an optimistic vein, and I want to say that up front because uh, I, I think it's important to understand what I'm about to say is uh, hopeful. And uh, I hope it's also practical and realistic, but it is definitely something that aims towards a meliorization of our existing conditions. Because, and here's the spoiler alert, I'm going to answer the question in the title before I even change the first image. Um, the answer is, to this question is no. Uh, and the reasons and ways in which the answer is no are significant. But uh, that should give us, I hope, a sense of renewed urgency on the question of public space and how we think about public spaces in our cities. Uh, I think it's well known that most Canadians now live in large cities strung across mostly the southern part of our geographical mass. Uh, it's also probably well known that most of the planet's inhabitants now live in cities for the first time in human history. Uh, this is only going to continue as a trend. Global cities are getting bigger and denser. And uh, we are lagging behind in our imaginative solutions to the problems that cities pose. Uh, I don't think that those problems are insuperable, but we need to exert the best of our intellect and imagination in order to begin solving them. Public space is, I think, a key place where this uh, uh, intellect and imagination has to be exercised. And that's what I hope to, uh, among other things, persuade you of tonight. So uh, just a word on how I'm going to proceed. Uh, normally, I hate PowerPoint, but this, this screen is so awesome <laughs> that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm totally happy right now. I could just leave this image and walk away. But uh, the only, only downside is that some of the images I have are of such a poor quality that they're going to look terrible on the screen. <laughs> normally, the screens are much crappier, and they, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to make an argument about the nature of public space and its relationship to the, to the category of public good. And I'm going to punctuate the argument with images mostly of artwork by Canadian artists, <clears throat> some of which you may recognize. And uh, I want to use this, uh, this series of detours to artwork to, I hope, create a kind of revelatory effect about our experience of ourselves in cities. Uh, this is sort of the, the stealth argument beneath the philosophical one that art has this power uh, in this realm as in others to reveal ourselves to ourselves. And uh, some of the art that I'm going to show you really, for me, changed my view of, of how to think about cities. And I hope it might do the same thing for you. Um, to speak just to this first image, this is a reference in a way to a remark by the novelist Jan Martel who wrote um, The Life of Pi who once compared Canada to a hotel. And he said that uh, he meant by that that people could come here and find welcome, a kind of hospitality, without question. And uh, I thought about that remark, and I like the positive spin that he put on it. But uh, the negative spin that I'm going to 
underscore tonight, and I don't think this is what Jan meant, but I think it's there, is that a hotel is a transaction. That is, you come and you pay for the hospitality that you receive. It's not actually hospitality in the sense of a freely given gift, the offer of accommodation, which is the essence of true hospitality. So I'm, I'm posing that as, as a deliberately um, unstable image to start with. Uh, the first thing I want to argue is that the city is a site of justice. And that might seem uncontroversial, uh, but I'm not sure that it is, actually, because a lot of people think of cities in other terms. They think of them as circulation systems or layers of market relations or uh, just conglomerations of people going about their private business. And as a philosopher, it's been very important for me to shift questions of legitimacy and uh, social justice from the abstract realm, where they're mostly pursued by philosophers, into the concrete realm of the city, of the actual built environments in which most of us live. Because I think it's, it, it has to be maintained that here, if anywhere, is where justice is going to be realized. It's not a matter of taxation schemes. It's a matter of the everyday interactions that we have with our fellow citizens on the streets in which we actually work and live and play, to uh, quote Anne. Um, it's not justice like this. It's, look how great that looks. I mean, that's just, uh, I, I just I'm so happy right now. But uh, it's, not, it's not this justice. Uh, it's, it's also not that justice. But I, I, this is another image that I love. This is the Palace of the Soviets, which, uh, speaking of built, built forms, was never built. Uh, it's, it's in the great catalog of unbuilt monumental architecture. But, but look at this, right? Uh, just to give you a sense, there's a, a, a you know, formation of airplanes. These are people down here. I mean, this, is, this wedding cake of monstrosity is just... Uh, but the, the Palace of the Soviets was supposed to be a kind of a monumental expression of a political vision. And uh, I think we can take that, just as we can take the comic book idea of the the Justice League of America, uh, as an idea of what justice could be, that we want things to be right and good. We want to get behind them and not just have our cities be second best or third best ways of getting along. I think we aspire to this as citizens. I know that I do, and when I talk to people about cities, that's how they passionately talk about them. I, I talk to Vancouverites, my, my family, most of my family lives here, they, they don't just want this to be a pretty city or you know, a nice place to, to visit or a nice place for some people to live. They want it to be a good city, a just city. And this aspiration is, as we know, at least as old as Plato's Republic. And I, I think it's older. It's, it's deep in our human DNA to want the places that we live to be good so that we can get behind them. The optimistic view of the city as a site of justice is something like this, that public spaces, the shared places, the built forms, will be public goods. And I'm going to return to exactly what it means for something to be a public good in a few minutes, but um, just take it as a naive uh, or um, a basic conception that, that it is something that's good for everybody. Right? So a public space is a public good. And we think, in an optimistic mood, that those public goods will create the opportunities for the kinds of conversation and interactions that create justice. So the, the traditional way of thinking about this is the so-called public sphere. Right? And this is supposed to give us, this is a kind of, for the, the philosophy geeks in the audience, this is the Habermasian idea of the rational presuppositions of discourse. That in a public sphere where we come together as fellow citizens to argue about what is good and right, the force of the better argument will hold sway. And that this conviction is what brings us together in the first place and what drives our actual messy practical conversations towards better conclusions. And that nothing that affects someone will be immune from that someone contributing to that conversation. So if you're affected by it, you were part of the conversation. Now, there are all kinds of objections to this very, very optimistic idea. There are uh, philosophical objections to the public sphere as it's usually been characterized being presumptively belonging to you know, white males of property, for example, uh, that access to this supposedly general public sphere is in fact gated or constrained in all kinds of ways. 
Uh, but I'm interested in, in more specific and maybe practical objections. Um, here's, uh, I should say, an optimistic view of how to realize a public sphere in architecture. This is Le Corbusier's famous plan. Uh, what you can recognize in this, this is supposed to be not only a rational and just public housing project, you can see this, but uh, it was supposed to um, solve the problem of density because all of this housing could accommodate famously three million people in this plant, the city of three million. Uh, but what you can also recognize here if you, if you have a keen eye is this very same cruciform uh, sky, skyscraper residence tower is exactly what was built in many of the public housing projects which later became uh, dysfunctional. And this includes in my own neighborhood in Cabbage Town in Toronto, uh, St. Jamestown and Regent Park, both right next door. Uh, and I'm going to return to Regent Park as an example. But this, this idea of the tower, uh, in effect, in, in practical terms, created a kind of denuded uh, baseline and um, vertical slums were the result in too many cases. So here's a clear example of where the aspiration the design aspiration has gone wrong, but not because the aspiration itself was wrong, but be, rather because its realization was imperfect. Uh, an image of uh, Montreal, in this case, by uh, the Midland, Ontario artist John Hartman. And I show this uh, because Hartman, I think, is probably the most successful artist revealing cities to themselves. Uh, what he shows us here is a kind of uh, I love the palette, the sanguinary Montreal, these the reds and purples, the beating heart of the city, um, just graphically realized here. And the way that he contours it so that you get a sense that you feel in Montreal, the, the relationship between the river and the mountain uh, and the, the ascent and descent, which is so significant. You feel it here in Vancouver, too, with the, the grades down to the shore. Uh, the, this is a notional vertical uh, or aerial standpoint, I should say. Um, Hartman doesn't have his own private helicopter. He imagines the city from above. And even that, the imagining from above, you can see it in the, the Corb. Um, this is already something that, that we take for granted, but is actually very important to think about the city from above and then moving down. And um, one of the, the most moving versions of this is the section in Michel de Certeau's book, The Practice of Everyday Life, called Walking in the City, which starts at the top of the now gone World Trade Center observation deck. And then after surveying the city, in that case Manhattan, descends to street level and to the actual interactions, the very physical experience of walking on the sidewalks of the city. And that up and down dynamic, I think, is really powerful for our sense of ourselves in cities. So what are the problems in a practical sense of, of the, this presuppositions idea? Um, free riders, people who decide to take the benefits of a scheme without contributing anything. That, I'm not saying that that woman is riding free. I just, this is an image of riding. I'm sure she paid her fare. Uh, opters out, which are distinct from free riders. Opters out are not taking benefits without paying. They're creating schemes of value that are outside so uh, this is the kind of opting out that I'm particularly worried about, where people take their lives and retreat fully into a private realm and feel justified in doing that because they think that that's what their life is. And then it becomes our duty, <clears throat> uh, well, as philosophers it becomes our duty, but as fellow citizens to try to persuade them that this is not a good option, that we are in a very important sense in this together and that private retreat is a bad idea. I'm going to hope to give you a version of that argument tonight. Uh, here's some artwork that, uh, this is by a Montreal-based artist called Ross Racine, who is an amazing artist, because he combines this vertical, um, or sorry, uh, aerial and, and ground, with a perfect graphic realization of the 90 degrees aerial view. These are computer-generated works of art from uh, a notional, you know, he likes to call it the magic carpet of his mind, looking straight down, literally straight down, into these um, super complex, you know, beyond absurdity versions of the a can of worms or, um, you know, confusing suburban layout. It's a great image, I think. Uh, there's a detail. Just these, uh, I don't know why, these, these things, I love them and they give me the creeps at the same time. I don't know if... Um, 
and there's one with a circular pattern. Just imagine trying to find your way to the cocktail party in that neighborhood. Uh, right. And um, two other kinds of, of problems or objections. One are cheats, and here I'm drawing on the distinction between <coughs> cheats and spoil sports um, that you can, one finds in Johann Heusinger's book, uh, Homo Ludens. Cheats are people who are, they're a bit like free riders, people who are taking advantage of the rules by bending them such that they accrue more advantage than the people who play by them. Right? Cheats are actually not such a big problem. Any system or game, I'm going to use the language of games from this point onward, any game can tolerate a certain number of cheats, uh, partly because you can punish them when they're caught. And if they're not caught, the costs to the overall game generally are low because by cheating, they actually reinforce the normativity of the rules that they're bending. Right? They're not actually trying to undermine the rules. They're just trying to get away with something around the edges. So to a certain point, you can tolerate cheats. You can even tolerate free riders. Opters out and this second category in the second pair, spoil sports, are actually much more significant and pernicious. Spoil sports, in contrast to cheats, are the people who try to actually stop the game or to undermine the game. And it's, the, it's like the person who says, it's my football and I'm taking it and I'm going home. You know, uh, the game is over because I'm ending the game. And the worst thing you can do with the kind of game that I'm talking about, which I'm going to call the game of justification, the worst thing you can do is end it in that way or dead end it or stonewall it. Now, it's interesting to, to consider the kinds of things that might constitute spoil sport. And I choose Bartleby here, partly because I've written a lot about Bartleby, uh, the Scrivener from Melville's story from 1851, uh, bec but significantly because he is a spoil sport whose position almost convinces you. And there are many interpretations of Melville's story, but that's the one I think is most compelling. You read that story. B Bartleby is the guy who famously says, I would prefer not to. How many of you have read the story? Just a few. Um, Bartleby, the Scrivener, it works in a law office in Manhattan. And in the days before photocopiers, multiple copies of legal documents had to be written out by hand. And this was a job called scrivening. <clears throat> and it was, in a sense, the, the perfect realization of a mechanical job. The truly great scrivener would be the person who could, without mistakes, copy a document five times and so that the multiple copies could go to the parties and the authorities. In the story, this figure Bartleby comes into a law office and is, for a time, the perfect scrivener, uh, working with tirelessly and with apparent uh, total accuracy. But sooner or later, he begins to refuse work, or actually technically doesn't refuse. He just says, I would prefer not to do that. And eventually, he would prefer not to leave the office. Eventually, he would prefer not to eat, uh, not to speak. And it's, it's a remarkable, if you only know Melville from Moby Dick, uh, this story has existential overtones that are almost a century um, soon. And uh, this figure of Bartleby becomes a kind of embodied critique of the transactions of the law firm and Wall Street. And in fact, the subtitle of the story is A Story of Wall Street. Uh, so Bartleby is an interesting spoil sport because he stands as a critique of the, the transactional model of the city. But in general, spoil sports are bad for the game of justification. And um, I'm going to try to explain why in a few minutes. OK. So second point, what are the main justice issues in diverse cities which characterizes most of the cities in Canada, um, many of the largest cities around the world. The first is obvious, density. We live in cities uh, partly because they're dense, but density is an inescapable feature of cities. There's my city uh, in its downtown core, looking rather glamorous, actually. Um, not that it deserves it, but um, that's density. And density is not straightforwardly a bad thing. Uh, Rem Koolhaas writes persuasively in his book, Delirious New York, that density creates all kinds of good things. Uh, so there was a school of, of urbanism planning that was very anti-density for a long time. And density is a complicated property. It's certainly, I want to say, an inescapable one. 
Density obviously breeds proximity. It becomes harder and harder in a denser city not to interact with your fellow citizens. Uh, you might not want this much proximity, uh, but it happens. And again, you can try to opt out, but there are still going to be times when proximity is inescapable. This creates externalities. And externalities, simply in economic terms, are the things that you have to deal with that you didn't contract for. So negative externalities would be things like noise pollution, uh, actual pollution, physical pollution, uh, things like uh, advertising, like that, which you might, I mean, some people like that sign. I don't, you know, they, they see it as welcoming. Um, I, I tend to see it as, as visual pollution. Uh, and here's Robin Collier's famous refiguring. This is actually was on the cover of Adbusters magazine. Robin uh, took all of the print out of this image. This is North York in Toronto. I love how this is just a great kind of repurposing so that the, the once advertising fields are just reimagined as formal deployments of color. And a great composition. And the, the um, awesome fact that they're their anoraks are exactly the same color. I, I like to imagine Robin sitting in this parking lot for hours and days, waiting, who, where are these guys? When are they coming? <clears throat> Not everybody thinks advertising is visual pollution, but if you do, then it's a negative externality. It's something which is part of your experience of the city, which you're not paying for and you're not being paid for. It's outside of contract. Traffic is an obvious negative externality uh, in, in this city. Uh, because of the geography, you get all kinds of traffic-based negative externalities if you choose to drive. And this is actually, this is in um, uh, Singapore, which is uh, brutal traffic. Traffic jams in um, other parts of the world are so much worse than they are in North America that uh, every time people complain about traffic here, I say, you know, go to Shanghai, where you, you could literally spend four hours in a traffic jam trying to get um, across the river. Uh, but there are positive externalities, too. Because externalities are not necessarily the things that you don't like. They could also be the things that you like that you don't pay for. And in the case of cities, that includes things like visual stimulation you enjoy. Rather than visual pollution, suppose you uh, are stimulated by the play of colors and sensations as you walk down the street. Uh, or the aesthetics of looking at other people on the street, sexual opportunities in the city. All kinds of stimulation that we associate with what Georg Zimmel called the metropolitan attitude are positive externalities. Right? The kinds of things that you might actually seek out in your urban experience. That you go to, this is um, Dundas Square in Toronto, that you go because you want to be part of a crowd and have the excitement of other people around you and food and smells and art and all the things that a city offers you that you don't pay for, that they're not part of the contract. A separate cluster of issues are, are more problematic than these ones. These, the first four are, are really just structural background conditions, justice issues, and diverse cities. Cultural identities, I think in Canada we are very aware of negotiating these. Um, and I show you some images here. These are not artworks, it's occasional photography, but um, this is Carabana which is the uh, Caribbean festival that happens every year in, in my city, in Toronto. Um, and this is uh, a Sri Lanka protest that closed down the Gardner Expressway. Uh, I like the juxtaposition here because um, the colors are, are so close. That's, I, I think that's uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, and then the, the Sri Lankan protest red is almost exactly the same. What's the difference between closing down a highway for this and closing it down for this. Um, one is an expression of cultural identity, but so is the other, arguably. And I should tell you, by the way, that I don't own a car and I don't usually drive, but I had been out of town to give a talk, and I'm just about um, a quarter of a mile down here, um, stuck there for hours. Uh, yeah, it was, anyway. Um, <laughs> It's an, it was an odd protest because it wasn't clear at all to anyone what closing down the Gardner Expressway would, would achieve for the Tamil cause. Uh, but it was an expression of a cultural identity. It was, we are taking to the streets to put our bodies in space. 
And uh, whatever the politics of it, you have to accept that this is an expression of cultural identity. Closely related to that is styles of communication. And you know, I, I'm talking here in a way that is pretty academic and uh, you know, of, a, of a kind. But I know that this is only one style of communicating and that there are lots of other ones. Uh, another juxtaposition of images, again, Caravana, and um, this kind of, of presentation of self in everyday life, which is sanctioned and, and approved and enjoyed. Uh, and then this one. And this is a, a shot, a screen grab from a, a gang video uh, from a, a gang based in, in uh, northern Toronto. Um, these are the ab calves, uh, which is, I mean, this is just... That's, if you don't know it, that's the refigured Toronto Blue Jays logo, where the Blue Jay is, is instead an Uzi. Um, that, that is just an awesome graphic. I don't, you know, I'm not condoning violence, I hope, in saying that, but that is just some smart graphic designer working for the Abcavs. Uh, but just notice this, these two images and the way that they both communicate. And the, the postures and the groupings of the bodies are so similar in this kind of um, presentation. Uh, so we're learning all of these things, and we go on learning them. Uh, I was saying to somebody earlier, I walked along West and then East Hastings this morning, and uh, when you get, you get to that part of East Hastings, you know, the, the um, downtown East Side, people walk differently. Even if they're not strung out or uh, using anything, they walk differently. Two guys walking together walk much farther apart on that sidewalk than they do downtown. Uh, it's just, just that is different. And uh, all kinds of things that, that you, I, I'm calling here communication style, physically enacted, and how our expectations about communication are mostly unspoken until we're confronted by this kind of difference, which typically makes us feel uncomfortable. Uh, that discomfort is a clue, though, to these larger issues, or, or so I want to suggest. Third in this second part of, of the issues, clustering. Uh, the reason that most of us don't have those experiences of discomfort unless we forcibly make ourselves go to other neighborhoods is because we tend to cluster amongst people like ourselves. And we don't only do this in neighborhoods. Studies have shown uh, in North America and Europe that um, over the past four or five decades, people are, are uh, forming romantic and family attachments with people much more like themselves in every way, class, education level, uh, race, than uh, had been the case even a few decades before that. Uh, and then we're going, in addition, into neighborhoods that tend to be pretty homogeneous. Right? Uh, this can lead to polarization. And by that, I mean the differences between a sense of one neighborhood as like this and another neighborhood, even very close, as like that. And my city is very much a city of neighborhoods, and I don't know yours well enough to, to judge, but um, that idea that the neighborhood, and you can even sometimes say the block that ends the neighborhood, uh, is different, is an issue that must be confronted when we think about justice in cities. Uh, my, my older brother lives in Chicago, and he lives right on the edge of a neighborhood. He's in Oak Park, which is, if you know it, a near suburb where Ernest Hemingway came from. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright worked there. And within a block, there is a change which is measurable in, in median income at something like thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a year, not to mention the racial differences. And so these kinds of boundaries, they may be less pronounced in other cities, but they are very much a factor when we think about justice in cities. I'll give you some statistics or at least some analysis from Toronto. This was done by my colleague David Holchansky at the City Centre at University of Toronto. Uh, what David and his students found is that the clustering and polarization in the metropolitan uh, uh, Toronto area showed circa 2005 what he calls three cities. The, you can see the, the, the income levels distributed here by colour and just the overview. This blue is the richest part of the city. Not surprisingly, the biggest part of it is, is clustered in traditional wealthy neighborhoods like Rosedale and Forest Hill and up into Moore Park and Lawrence Park. And it, it controls the young university subway line. I mean, I don't, I don't think that's the wrong word to use. It, it dominates 
this subway line. It was, that subway line was built for this city, this blue city. And then its eastern and western um, counterparts are gentrification areas. Right? So um, the, the nice parts of Parkdale out to uh, the west, um, Cabbage Town over here, the beach over here. And then this area actually um, is even more wealthy now. This is the, the now growing condo tower cluster at the foot of um, the Toronto uh, Union Station area. The, the white is middle income. And then the, the reds and dark reds are lower income to the east and west. So Scarborough here, Rexdale. Right? What's interesting to notice about this, this is maybe not surprising, but it's trending. So the projection is that this trend of clustering and polarization, combined trend, will continue and be exacerbated so that there will be no longer two cities, or three cities, but only two. And th which is to say, oops, that um, what once was this kind of, this is Willowdale and other parts of North York, um, middle income, middle class, will be either collapsing back into lower income or being um, bounded into higher income. And the gentrification projects will continue to expand where possible, where the money is available along the subway lines. You can find similar statistics in several other Canadian cities. Now, what's wrong with this, if anything? I think what's wrong with it is the association of wealth inequality with geographical distribution of neighborhoods. Because it affects the ability of people of lower income to be part of and enjoy the city. And this is a justice issue. It's a justice issue that goes beyond just what, what you think about the distribution patterns of income, but rather about how those distributions actually get geographically enabled and reinforced. So clustering creates a problem of access to amenities. I mean, just to go back to this, notice how the subway lines um, uh, just simply don't serve big chunks of the city. Right? I mean, the university line here ends... Uh, up there at, uh, what is that, um, Lawrence West. And this whole chunk of the city is served only by buses. This is the LRT into Scarborough, uh, which was a, a well-meant and somewhat successful extension of the line there. But again, whole chunks, right, which are not served. Now, there is public transit, but it's buses. And if you've ever seen people waiting for buses in the deep winter, uh, it is one of the bleakest sites imaginable, especially when a lot of these people uh, are living in neighborhoods where they literally cannot walk to anywhere to buy groceries. So we're not talking yet about so-called food deserts, which you get in, in some parts of North America where it's impossible to get groceries without a car. You can still get groceries with transit here, but you can't walk. Now, just think about that. I mean, think about the daily issue of getting the food that you want to cook and serve to your family that has to be gotten either with a car or on a bus, that you cannot walk to it. A lot of us who live downtown take for granted the luxury of just going out and getting something to eat without having to plan a trip. So access to amenities, and it also includes amenities that have to do with the other parts of, of a city's life. Most of the entertainment and cultural opportunities are down here. And I think you'd find a similar pattern probably in Vancouver. Um, that is the museums, the sports uh, venues, uh, the public spaces like parks and the waterfront. Uh, actually getting there from these parts of the city becomes itself an issue. The polarization, um, there's, <laughs> this is someone getting her groceries. Uh, uh, that picture, that, it's, too, it's too big. I can't look at it. Um, the polarization is supposed to be <laughs> countered by the so-called contact hypothesis. And if, if you know the literature, the contact hypothesis is that when people come into contact with each other in diverse cities, they become more tolerant. Because diversity, this idea is at least as old as Montaigne's essays from the 1580s, that uh, the more experience you have of difference, the more tolerant you will be. What we're finding in more recent studies, mostly from England, which, you know, there's a lot of uh, cross-currents there of race and, and religious tension. Uh, but the contact hypothesis is being disproven over and over again, which is to say contact is leading to more intolerance rather than more tolerance. 
And that tends to reinforce this clustering and polarization. People are not becoming more tolerant when they come into contact with difference, rather less. Uh, and that in itself is a very worrying finding. Uh, there's Regent Park, and I wanted to uh, return to it as promised. This is the idealized version of the current redesign of Regent Park. And uh, what you can see there is um, a few things. The creation of new public spaces, this, this green space, which in the existing design is, is mostly dead space per the you know, dysfunctional version of the Corbusier vision. Um, but maybe more importantly is a whole bunch of mixed income and mixed use housing. So some public housing, some private and condo housing in an overall plan development. I'm not sure yet whether this is going to work. This is still um, in the process of being built. Uh, but it is clearly an attempt to find a kind of solution to the issues that I'm talking about. Uh, there has to be a, a curb on the privatization of housing. You can't simply allow gentrification waves to roll over your neighborhoods. Uh, but isolating public housing in areas that are completely distinct from other neighborhoods has proven to be a mistake. Mixed use might actually work, and in, in some cases it has. Uh, I was saying uh, earlier today, um, people forget that Manhattan would not be the way it is without rent control. And all the things that, that everyone loves about Manhattan are unimaginable without rent control departments. And rent control is one of the clearest ways to insist on a mixed income neighborhood. All right, um, more specifically now to get to the, the heart of the matter, public space is a public good. Here's the, the more technical version of the public good argument. Um, public goods are <clears throat> fall into this quadrant where they are non-rival and non-excludable. Um, in basic terms, that means non-rival. If you use a public good, somebody else's use of it should not be impaired. Right? So we're not competing for the enjoyment of it. And non-excludable means nobody can be prevented from using it. It's open to all. Now the question, is public space a public good, I think is going to turn on not the non-excludable, because uh, if, any, if, if public space means anything, I think it has to mean that it's non-excludable. Right? You can't bar someone from public space and still call it public space. The question is going to be probably whether it's non-rival, uh, which is to say whether enjoying public spaces leaves as much and as good for others to also enjoy. And here I'm not so sure. Right? I think we might actually have to go for a second best um, assessment that public spaces are often at best commons goods rather than public goods. Though I believe that we should aspire to make them genuine public goods always. Um, you can see some of the classic examples of, of commons goods, fish in the sea, atmosphere, public waterways. I won't, I mean these private and low congestion goods are probably obvious, private goods especially. Uh, so the, this is the interesting territory right here, the threshold between commons goods and public goods. And that's where rivalry comes into play, right, right there on that quadrant. And I think that, that's the battlefield of most people's controversies concerning public space. Is my use of it versus your use of it something that is going to impair one of us or both? Now... <clears throat> If something is genuinely non-rival, it cleaves to what Henri Lefebvre called the right to the city. Right? That is that um, everybody has an equal right to the city. And like all rights, this is not transactional. It is beyond transaction. Right? A right is not a negotiation. It's not a contract. It means that everybody has as much as each other. The non-excludable, if it operates, which I think it has to, uh, would be ruling out the possibility of invisible gates. Obviously, it rules out actual or visible gates, but there are invisible gates, too. Uh, I think a lot about this one. Christopher Alexander, who was one of the great uh, urbanists of the 20th century, uh, once wrote that the true test of a public space is whether you could sleep there. Uh, and uh, yeah, as opposed to, and he was quoting Flann O'Brien, or O'Brien, if you're a purist, um, about uh, the policeman being the person who moves you along when you want to sleep, you know, um, move along there now. And, and he said, you know, if you are allowed not to be moved along, that is a genuine public space. If you can stretch out and take your ease. Right? But notice what we, this, this 
See, that's an image that doesn't improve at this size. Um, this is what we've done to our, our spaces. Right? We've created benches that you can't sleep on. They're designed precisely to prevent you from sleeping on them. And you might not notice this if all you want to do is sit on one, because you can still sit on one. But notice, again, the bodies in space, right? The actual deployment of the physical human form in this space. And we have designed this in a way to say, no, you can't sleep here. We don't want anyone sleeping. And there's an ideology contained in this design, which is absolutely present, but, but masquerades as, as being invisible. And that's why this, this um, art project uh, is, is so poignant, you know, to, to try to deploy the body over this anti-sleeping bench. Uh, I know some students, design students uh, in Montreal who created uh, huge styrofoam tubes, which they distributed to homeless people in Montreal, um, that were thick enough so that you could actually drape yourself over these anti-sleeping benches and comfortably sleep. So you'd, you'd put on this, this styrofoam cocoon and use it as the countermeasure to the anti-sleeping bench. That's awesome. Um, uh, ideally, public spaces, if they're public goods, should be non-zero sum as well. There should be no competitive consumption. So not only just non-rival, but that we shouldn't actually be competing to have the good in the first place. Right? Uh, I, again, just artwork to uh, reveal. Um, this is a distant shot of a piece by um, my friend, um, the artist Ante Lu. This is called Title Deed. Um, and you can see this is a wonderful piece because he takes this house. This is in North York, Toronto. And uh, this house had been foreclosed. And um, its, its inhabitants forcibly evicted. And he got permission from the city while the, the property was in... Um, uh, foreclosure to execute this artwork. And what he does, he, the perfectly realized monopoly piece right, um, on an actual house, which I just I think is amazing to, to have this kind of reminder that that particular game is the one that, that often governs um, the competition for space. This is private space, to be sure, but still, um, that monopoly game that we're all forced to play when it comes to housing. Now, where is the, the justice to be realized in the public space as public good? Well, the first question we need to ask is, does this justice have to be egalitarian in a strong sense, or can it be what, what philosophers call sufficitarian? And I want to advance that modest argument, that it can be sufficitarian. It doesn't have to even out all differences, but it has to even out enough of the access differences to make sure that public spaces are at least commons goods and at best genuine public goods. The first challenge to doing that is what's called regulatory capture. And that is the idea that um, the regulators of a given sector can be captured or bought off by interests within the sector, usually private interests or corporate interests. Uh, this doesn't have to be, I'm using this graphic of you know, an actual payoff. Uh, but regulatory capture can be a lot subtler than that, where uh, the sector, uh, the interests within the sector can actually affect the regulators, not with money, but with their own influence and their expression of interest. And uh, I was talking to, to Gordon beforehand about this. I don't want to give the impression that all developers are evil, um, but some of them are. And the ones that are, are very interested in regulatory capture, because the more they capture the regulation, the more they're able to maximize their profits. Now, the regulation is there as a public trust. It's there to protect the interests of justice. And insofar as the regulators, regulators are captured, uh, they are failing in their duties to justice. They're failing in their public trust. Uh, we should all be on guard for this. This is not just a matter of individual regulators. Right? This is a trend. And you see it in all kinds of sectors in our uh, society. I don't want to say our economy, our society. Another problem, or cluster of problems, comes with so-called collective action issues. And that is to say, especially when it comes to commons, um, the prisoner's dilemmas, races to the bottom, but especially ratchets, especially tragedies of the commons. And um, this is one of my, this is a graphic representation of the tragedy of the commons. <laughs> so I'm sure you, yeah, take a picture of that, because um, that's going to be important later on the exam. Uh, <laughs> 
The tragedy of the commons idea is vivid. It, it, this is the technical version. We all know the idea. Um, Garrett Hardin is the, the person who wrote the article, but the idea is basic. When there's a commons good, which is non-excludable but rival, my use of it and your use of it, because it's rival, may actually destroy the good. So in a com an actual common grazing land within a village, I have an incentive to have more cattle or sheep grazing on the land so that I can maximize my interests. If I have one cow, why not have two cows? Why not have three? Why not have five, 10? You have exactly the same incentives as I do. So what starts out as a common, that is a shared good, Okay. Because it's rival, that is because our use of it actually takes away from the use of it by others, can actually self-defeat. And all kinds of public spaces, as commons goods, are subject to this tragedy. Right? That is, the more we use them from our own personal interests, the more we might actually ruin it for everyone, including ourselves. Right? So this is where rivalry becomes self-defeating. And these kinds of problems, so-called collective action problems, oh, this is just a, a race to the bottom. Um, it's, it's really out of date because uh, reality shows are so bad now that it's not even funny anymore. That's, that's why none of you are laughing, so thanks for that. Um, but collective action problems are, are everywhere around us. So take the example that I mentioned before of the Tamil protests, the Sri Lanka protests. Uh, public opinion was not swayed by this except in the negative most people in Toronto just became more angry and less supportive of the Tamil cause because of this, I would say, justified public action. So that actually is a miniature version of a collective action problem because they self-defeat insofar as the, the desired aim of public support or public action is actually um, going in the wrong direction. The basic problem here, and I don't think this will be any surprise to anyone who knows my work, uh, is that the market dominates far too much of, of our life. It dominates far too much of our cities. And it certainly dominates private, uh, public space. Most of what is called public space is not actually public space. It's private or privately dominated space, which masquerades as public. And one of the first tasks we have as citizens is to start unmasking these uh, masquerades right? that we should expose whenever there is a genuine public space versus one that is only a pretend public space, but actually one that's dominated by private interests. Uh, I don't have to rehearse here the collective action problems, the self-defeats of a market-dominated society. We all lived through 2008. Um, we're all still hanging on here. The analysis of what happened, I don't think is any longer in doubt. And it wasn't just a matter of individual greed, it was a matter of structural self-defeat. And it was because there's an ideology of market dominance which goes unquestioned in far too many quarters of our society. <laughs> I love this, this guy has a bad day in 2008. But it creates other pathologies that are worth emphasizing too. One is a culture of entitlement. Uh, and by that I mean uh, not the sort of, you know, people complain about the narcissism of, of people on Twitter. and so I don't I care about that. I mean, that might be true. I'm talking about the idea that everybody thinks that their private interests are beyond question. That's the culture of entitlement. Because we're working from the wrong premises. We're working from premises that say what I want and what I believe is primary, and then it's a negotiation with others. Right? Rather than there is no me without the others. There is no interest that I call mine without others who recognize me, who give me the blessing of existence. And this is such an old presumption. I mean, it's 400 and some years of modernism and individualism that have given us this idea of the primacy of the private, that we have great work to do, politically speaking, to try to fight back against it. Also, positional goods. Positional goods are those ones that we aspire to because our enjoying them means that someone else doesn't have them. Right? They, we oc occupy a position that someone else doesn't have. They're good positional goods. Don't, you know, Olympic medals are positional goods. You know, I came first. What is the, the Simpsons? The, the triumph of gold, the failure of silver, and the, the, the shame of bronze. Um, 
So those are the positions. Uh, those, are, those are good positional goods. But most positional goods are consumption goods, right? where I, I have something or I enjoy something because you don't. And that's part of what I want from it, that you don't have it. And um, this is facilitated by, but also reinforces, the wealth inequality I spoke of uh, earlier. Just to give you some graphics, uh, I won't go through this at all. This is just a graphic representation of wealth concentration. This, these are American statistics. So I, I will note what we all know, that the Canadian um, version of this is not so stark, but it's still pretty damn unequal. Uh, the top there, you can see it in the, the square right here, the top 0.01% um, controlling uh, a massive proportion of the wealth that's available and all down the line. Um, maybe more telling is this graph, which shows you at the top the actual distribution of wealth, uh, where the top 20% control that much of 100% of the wealth, and the bottom 20% of the population, that is, control or enjoy that proportion. So that's just that top there is a bar graph version of that whole slide. But notice the two other ones. In, again, American statistics, the second bar, what Americans think it is. So Americans are well aware that wealth is unequally distributed, but what they imagine is far more egalitarian than what is actually the case, far more. I mean, look at this. This expansion of, of the bottom uh, quintiles way up to almost a third or more of the available. And then, even more interesting, what they would like it to be. So in their imaginations, American citizens are far more egalitarian even than what they suppose is the case and even then more so than what is actually the case. Right? Look at this. I mean, this expands the bottom four quintiles to dominate more than half of the available wealth. Right? So this is a significant statistic, not only because of this is what it is, but because of the force of imagination that governs, or rather doesn't govern, this question of wealth inequality. Because as long as people think this is what it is, their desire or urgency to realize this is lessened because they don't see the gap between this one and this one. So what, does, what do these three things create as a fourth thing? What I want to call the evisceration of shared interests, the sense of people being individuals first and members of society second. And what goes along with that, the vanishingly small importance of public trusts when public trust should really be at the center of our society. Uh, this is another work of art that I wanted to show you. Yes, this is a nice way of making this point. Here's the final version. Right. Currency is a trust. Um, a bank is a trust, even if it's not called one. Your currency, your cash is trash, as we used to say, uh, unless somebody else takes it. And that is a collective undertaking. It's a trust. The whole economy is a trust. But we keep forgetting this, I think. I, maybe not the people in this audience, I don't know. Um, but I think as a culture, as a whole, as a society, um, we are failing in our awareness of this. Um, I, it, it wouldn't be a complete presentation unless there were zombies. So <laughs> there are the zombies. Um, this is the the 28 days later fast zombies. I like the fast zombies. Um, the zombie selves, and I, I just, um, this is a trope that I, I explored in my collection, Unruly Voices. Um, I think we're actually, we're, you know, the zombie movies and the, and the Walking Dead are all about we're the ones who are fighting off the zombies. We're not zombies yet, right? That's the whole, the trope, right? But actually, I want to say we're already the zombies. The problem is not that the zombies are coming. It's that we are the zombies, that we're consuming ourselves from within by pursuing these positional goods, right? by reinforcing and not challenging a culture of entitlement, by allowing shared interests to be eviscerated and giving up on or neglecting public trusts. We're eating ourselves, we're eating our brains from the inside. There they are again. I like the way they kind of come across the screen like that. Right. Um, so. <clears throat> But it is us. It is us because capitalism isn't some conspiracy. Capitalism isn't, <clears throat> you know, uh, the boogeyman. 
Right? Capitalism is us. Right? So we have to be on our guard about this. We have to be vigilant, and we have to fight back. So some, some possible ways of doing that. I mentioned this. I use this <clears throat> title because this is a, a collection of essays on public space that uh, I edited with a colleague. And partly to show you this artwork, this is a, a Kamloops BC artist, Lisa Klapstock, uh, in a, a series of works that she called um, Living Room. Uh, and this, just uh, go back to this one. What Lisa did for this series was uh, find discarded furniture in alleyways in Toronto and dressed in her hazmat suit, um, inhabit the living rooms that they created, the living rooms. Uh, and then she's holding the plunger on her camera. I don't know if you can see that right there. And then the line comes down to where the camera's. Um, and she always has this stern expression. Um, and the plunger then becomes almost like a sort of you know, explosive device where she captures this image of the discarded furniture, the alleyway. Uh, and a lot of her work is playing with this interstitial space between the public and the private, the alley, uh, and the threshold. And here's some more work of hers from a series called Thresholds where uh, she captures these images by looking through spaces and fences from the alley. These are really great. I don't know if it's sharp enough. Uh, typically, in these compositions, here's a few more. The, uh, the, the target um, image or the part of the image that's captured here right, is in sharp focus. And then the fence goes into a kind of um, blurry foreground. And I think they're just beautifully composed. But, but there's also, I mean, this is voyeurism, right? She's actually spying on people's backyards through the gaps. And I love this, playing around with the threshold, that she's, in a sense, reclaiming the visual field of the so-called private realm. I suppose if you were in one of those houses, you wouldn't maybe <laughs> take that aesthetic view of this. Uh, but I, I love the idea of playing with this, this threshold space, right? standing outside, um, looking inside. And that's what a threshold is. You know, A threshold, um, the word comes from the word uh, to hold the thresh, the straw, where you would wipe your feet to purify your passage from the outside to the inside. And the threshold, therefore, is neither outside nor inside, simultaneously both outside and inside, that line that creates the, the inside and outside, the boundary. And the boundary is essential to the public and private, the sacred, the profane, you know, all of these things, this kind of dichotomy. We cross thresholds all the time, but they're actually hugely powerful. Uh, and I think thinking about thresholds is one way to begin revealing our public-private uh, paradoxes to ourselves. Uh, the other thing about thresholds, I um, just uh, saw some psychological uh, evidence that shows that people have cognitive deficits when they cross thresholds. So uh, I'm, I'm advocating crossing thresholds in a philosophical way. Psychologists are telling us that when you cross thresholds, um, you actually suffer a loss of cognition. That's why you can't remember what you came upstairs to get, or uh, you know, you you find yourself in the living room wondering uh, what you were supposed to be going for, and so on. Um, so be careful of thresholds; they're they're um, powerful in in lots of ways and maybe dangerous. Uh, but it's interesting, right? Because what it reminds us of is the phenomenology of of very ordinary lived experience. And I've been emphasizing, you know, bodies and space, configurations of the body. Uh, but we're always having these experiences. We walked into this room or walk out again, the inside, the outside. This is the everyday grain of life in the city. Uh, but it, it has all of these philosophical and political implications that I'm trying to gather together here. Most importantly, perhaps of all, is this point. That um, rather than private space being primary and public space carved out of it, it should be the other way around. That in short, the line between public and private is a public argument. Where the private ends and the public begins and vice versa is always something we argue about publicly. And if we, if we actually enacted this, if we reverse this polarity, right, public first, private second, line between public and private always itself a public debate, we'd be a big step ahead on thinking about the actual public spaces in our cities but more than that, about justice in our cities. 
that the, the opters out and, and the spoil sports would have a harder time getting away from the justificatory conversation of that idealized public sphere, that we would be demanding public justification of private interests, demanding public justification of transactions that take things from the public trust and put them in private hands. And we might object and say, no, that should never be the case with this public trust. It must always be public and never privatized. It's only if we have this conversation, though, that we'll be able to make those kinds of arguments. Um, quickly, these are um, um, images that I just love because uh, the uh, work of, of Jin Dan Wen, who's a, uh, uh, I can't remember, Beijing or, or Shanghai-based uh, artist, who takes architectural maquettes, uh, which are the, the, you know, the sort of the ultimate abstract model of what a city is, and then hides little psychodramas within them. So I don't know if you see here, there's that <laughs> detail. <laughs> I don't know why I like that so much. Uh, but you know, normally there's no people at all in these maquettes, but here's this, this thing happening. There it is again. Um, in this one, uh, you, get a, you get a point if you can spot it. It's this car crash down here. It was there. Right. And um, this one is maybe even harder to see. But <laughs> and uh, actually can't even see where it is right now. Um, anyway. And then this one, I'll give you a clue up here. Oops. Um, bad day at the office for her. So uh, anyway, um, these are really interesting ways of, of revealing what we all know to be the case, right? The, the, the private lives that are lived in public, the private tragedies, which are part of, of society, uh, that, you know, we often isolate ourselves, but we're, we, we are not and we should not be alone. We are in this together in a very important way. So um, this is to return to a very old point, uh, one that you can find in everyone from Adam Smith to um, some contemporary commentators, that the moral value of public life, the governing value of public life, is the sense of connection. Uh, I hesitate sometimes to use the word empathy because it has that, that connotation of, I feel your pain. You know? And we all know that technically nobody feels anybody else's pain. But what empathy, I think, really means is, first of all, being pained at the pain of others, to be common with someone in their suffering. And more than that, more, more profoundly, to, to reiterate a point I made before, empathy is the reminder that without you, I'm nothing. That there is no me, there is no individual, unless I am recognized. That unless you give me the blessing of recognition, there is no me, and I am adrift. And disintegrating. And this is really to, to, again, reverse a polarity, the idea that somehow we know who we are as individuals and we move out from that, is to miss something profound about the human condition, which is that, uh, that we are together here. And that that is what I am, right? being recognized by you. And in this case, listening with, with the wonderful attention that you've been giving me, uh, to, to have that is to be me. Uh, and we forget this because we spend so much of our time in these isolated positions. Uh, we must be reminded, and we must remind ourselves of this profound notion of empathy. Um, here's the, the cynical. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, so uh, what this means in the end, I think, is again an old point, but one that bears repeating over and over and over again. And that is that democracy, democratic justice, is an infinite game of justification. I mentioned the game language before. Two things, an infinite game and a game of justification. It's an infinite game because unlike finite games, it won't come to a conclusion or an outcome. There may be temporary outcomes, you know, things on the procedural side of politics like elections. And probably to our detriment, we talk about those in the same language that we use to talk about you know, the Canucks playing Dallas tonight or whatever, that, that, that's the finite game language, outcome-oriented. Right? But infinite games are ones that know that any node of decision is only temporary. 
and that there's always more to be said. There's always more moves to be made and more things to be said. So the game continues, always. There is no end to the game of democracy. It is never an outcome. It is a process. And what kind of process? A process of justification, by which I mean, why do you have something that somebody else doesn't? Why do I enjoy something that somebody else doesn't? In the case of the city and public space, why is this enjoyment or this place something that I can be and not something that someone else can be? Why is this a good for me but not a good for someone else? We return then to the line between commons goods. We don't exclude people. Right? At least we don't on principle or explicitly. But we might actually become rivals for these things. We might say, I want this, and I might use it in such a way that means that you can't. And that's the battleground right, right there between commons and public goods. And if public space means anything, I don't think it has to be the full-blown you know, um, solution to all our democratic justice problems. But in cities, it's a test case. It is the place that we should look first to see whether our cities are even approaching the idea of justice. Because there, we will be able to tell, usually quite immediately, whether the game of justif justification continues, as it must. And a final look, um, John Hartman again, a very, very optimistic, and I like to think sometimes um, accurate portrayal of my city. Thank you very much.